Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Imagine you needed some coffee to be ground, and the only place that you could do it was a Starbucks nearby to your house. Would you succeed in accomplishing this mission? What I'm about to tell you is a real-life scenario. A client who had read a very good book on negotiation decided to put that knowledge into practice. He was going to try and get the Starbucks guy to grind his coffee. So the plan was put in action. He was going to go to the cafe. He was going to get the coffee ground. And I waited. When the client came back, I asked him whether he had achieved his mission. You probably know the answer, don't you? He'd failed in his mission, and he was slightly perplexed. Was it because he got the negotiation wrong? Was it because there were too many objections? For instance, the coffee could have been contaminated. Maybe the Starbucks guy is not allowed to grind anybody else's coffee. Maybe there's a company policy in place. But what about the negotiation? Because when you look at negotiation, you're not dealing with familiar territory. It's like a kidnapper that has taken away your child. You want the child back. But here's the biggest question of all in every sort of negotiation, whether you're dealing with someone at the cafe or a kidnap or in a business meeting. And the question is, what do they want? Not what do you want, because that's tunnel vision. We all go into a situation We were looking at what we want, but the question is, what do they want? And my first question to this client was, what is the name of the barista? And he couldn't give me his name. Where does he live? What's his family background? Is he familiar with you? All of these things sound pretty weird when you're talking to a kidnapper, but this is the kind of dialogue that lots of agents have to have when they have a situation. Negotiation might seem like something very alien, but in reality, it's very simple. It is What does the client want? And at a very basic level, there are three things that anybody wants. So let's take on those three things, shall we? Let's keep this really simple so that you can remember and you can use this in further negotiations. The first thing that most people want is acknowledgement. The second is they want something for themselves. And the third is They want something for somebody else. Let's start out with the first one, which is the acknowledgement. On October 19, 1948, an ad ran in the New York Times. This was in the time when newspapers were large. And you'd hold it in front of you and it would cover your face and half your body. And that was the size of the ad. It had 6,450 words. There was no photograph, no drawing, no table, no chart, no graph. Just a page full of 6,450 words. And by some coincidence, it was the longest ad in the history of the New York Times. The headline wasn't spectacular. It just said what everybody ought to know about this stock and bond business. So did the ad have results? A month after publication, 5,033 requests had been received, and then 4,000 of them were in the first week, 3,534 came by mail, 947 by telephone, and they had 552 visitors to the Merrill Lynch offices. Because it was a Merrill Lynch ad. 
And there are urban legends saying that Merrill Lynch got over 3 million responses. And so we are all impressed by these results. We're impressed by the numbers. But Louis Engel Jr. was the copywriter of this ad, and he was looking at negotiation. America had been through this whirlpool called the Great Depression, and people wanted nothing to do with Wall Street. They wanted nothing to do with stocks or bonds or investing. They stayed away from looking at the information, reading any information. People were simply not interested. But Louis Engel Jr. decided that he was going to acknowledge these people who wanted to change how they went about the investing. Yes, the ad got results, but what was most amazing, Engel recalled, was that we got hundreds and hundreds of long and thoughtful letters. Some respondents were profusely appreciative. One person wrote, God bless Merrill Lynch. I've been wanting to know this all my life. I've owned stocks and bonds, but I never really knew what I owned. You see what just happened there? When we write a sales page, make a presentation, or just try to get a kid to give up their toy and go to bed, what we're doing is negotiating. And we have to first acknowledge the other person, because without that acknowledgement, we become a stranger. Nobody wants to listen to us. When you go to a cafe, and if you don't know the name of your barista, you don't know the name of the server, you don't know anything about anyone, there is no reason for them to know anything about you or want to do anything for you. And then what we have is a transaction. You exchange money, you exchange goods, you exchange information, and they give you the same. But you haven't created any sort of leverage because you've not acknowledged them. And this acknowledgement business is so obtuse because it's hard to nail down how you're going to acknowledge them. I'll give you an example. We were in a cafe in Frankfurt with our friend Herman, and we were sitting on the mezzanine floor, which is one floor up. So the waitress had to climb up back and forth several times a day, and she had to carry the cakes and the coffee and whatever anybody ordered. Now, this was about 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It was a hot day, and the waitress made one more trudge up. And as she approached our table, Renuka said, Oh, this must be so tiring to have to go up and down and up and down the whole day. And you don't have to be there to know what happened next. The moment you acknowledge somebody... They change completely. They change their behavior towards you completely. So if you're thinking of negotiation, you're thinking, well, I'm going to convert someone. I'm going to change the way they think. I'm going to do something because I've read a book or listened to a podcast. Then you missed out on the basic principle. And the basic principle is simply that first you have to acknowledge the other person. And one of the easiest ways to acknowledge somebody is to just describe what they might be going through or just ask for their name. You'll be surprised at how many people go through life in a nameless, faceless way because they're just there in the background doing something and then we go through a transaction. When you ask for someone's name, you change the dynamics. When you find out a little bit about them, you're going way beyond what most people do. And when you acknowledge the situation that they're in, you're behaving like a human being should. And these are not checkboxes. This is just the acknowledgement factor. Because if you're dealing with your three-year-old who doesn't want to go to bed, well, they already know their name and they know that you know their background. But you haven't acknowledged their situation. And that's why they're throwing that mega tantrum. Because everybody, no matter what their age, what their situation, or how much power they have, they all want to be acknowledged. And that is the first and probably the most important rule of negotiation. You have to know the person that you're dealing with, and you have to acknowledge the situation that they're in. And that brings us to the end of the first part of this podcast. 
let's move to the second part where we look at what is it that they want not what you want we already know what you want what do they want In South Africa, there is a flower that only one insect can access. Orpheum flowers don't contain nectar. Instead, they provide bees with pollen. Yet, not every insect can access the pollen. If you look closely at an orpheum flower, you'll find that the stamens are twisted, and this in turn prevents the pollen from being stolen by visiting insects. Only one insect has access to the pollen in that orpheum flower. That insect is the female carpenter bee. When she approaches the orpheum flower, her flapping wings make a particular buzzing sound. Yet that sound won't make a difference to the flower. The stamens remain locked. At which point, the bee changes the beat of her wings, creating what we'd call the C note. That simple act gets the flower to seemingly unlock and shower the bee with pollen. So that's just nature doing its thing. But notice the bee came in with her agenda. And the Ophium flower, not interested. Not at all. Not until the bee decided, okay, I have to give the flower what it wants. That specific note. And when we're doing any kind of negotiation with someone, we have to know what they want. There is a problem, though. You don't know what they want, and they often don't know what they want. When I used to do the presentation on the brain audit, I used to tell this story. It was how my wife, Renuka, and I went to the store to buy a desk. And there was a $200 desk and a $300 desk. And, of course, we were new in New Zealand, and we had a very strict budget and I went for the $200 desk. Did I know what I wanted? No, of course not. Why? Because I bought the $300 desk. How did that happen? The salesman showed me the differences between the desk. He said that the $200 desk was made of that particle board and that it wasn't something that he'd recommend. In fact, he said it's kind of so wobbly that when it's raining... They're a little careful bringing those desks in. And irrational as it may seem, I was worried about that, as though my office was outside, outdoors, and it would rain and the desk would fall apart. But then he also showed me the sides of the desk, and then he asked me what color I would like the desk in, and I said black, and of course, the $200 desk was not available in black. It was available in beige and white and not black. So I ended up buying the $300 desk. How did the salesman get me to go up 50% on my budget? Because he figured out that I didn't know what I wanted. And the only way that he could get me to move quite considerably, despite having a budget, is to have this conversation with me. We're on the internet these days, and we try to get all this data from the way people do things and how they act and what they click on, and we've forgotten that people chatter a lot, that if you would just speak to them, you would find out what they wanted. But first, you have to go through the stages. Step one, you have to acknowledge them. Take, for instance, the curious case of the Birkin bag. A new one costs around $10,000, and a vintage one would probably cost around $450,000 at auction. Obviously, the people who want to buy this bag are socialites, movie stars, or just wannabes. And you can't just go into the store and buy it. You have to be invited. 
and you can only get invited if you buy some scarves and belts and shoes and perfume and jewelry and you have to do all of this stuff weeks or months in advance and only then will the company Hermes send you an invitation and the invitation is inconsistent you can spend thirty thousand dollars forty thousand dollars sixty thousand dollars and only at some point do they decide okay you qualify so in this case it's not the company that's trying to sell something it's a customer that's trying to buy something first they have to acknowledge the company in a weird way they have to go and buy a b c d who knows goes to m maybe it goes to j maybe it goes to r and that way they're acknowledging the company and then the birkin people they say okay fine we get what you want and we'll give it to you because you've had this conversation with us by buying all of these thousands of dollars worth of goods. But no matter how you look at negotiation, you have to understand that there has to be this two-step process. The first step being that you have to acknowledge that the other person exists and how you do it, that's up to you. But you have to acknowledge it. So you've got to know them, get to know them somehow. Then you have to have a conversation with them. How the conversation unfolds depends on what kind of hostage situation it is, whether you're dealing with a kidnapper or you're dealing with a bag company or a three-year-old. But you've always got to ask yourself, what do they want? So we've looked at the first two steps, but there is a third step, and that is, what do they want for someone else? One of my most favorite books when I just started out in business was Harvey McKay's Swim with the Sharks Without Being Eaten Alive. Now, I don't know whether this story was in that particular book, but I was reading a lot of Harvey Mackay back then. And he talked about how he was trying to sell envelopes because that's what his company did. So he was selling these envelopes to some other company and he couldn't get any sort of breakthrough. He couldn't negotiate with them at any level. Anyway, he's sitting in the CEO's room and he does what you and I do on a regular basis. We're making a pitch. We're trying to negotiate. We're trying to get our point across. And somewhere the CEO mentions that his son is collecting some kind of stamps, maybe stamps about trains, for example. Now, a lot of people are so busy or so focused on what they want that they don't pay attention to all of these side conversations. You might be on WhatsApp with your client and they start talking about some bizarre converter for their pen, or they might talk about some kind of food stuff that they like. And it's natural for us to then go back to ourselves and talk about the food stuff that we like and the pen that we have. And we don't notice what they're actually saying And they're not telling you anything in particular, but Harvey Mackay went out and did what most of us should do, which is to get stuff that the CEO doesn't want, but that the kid of the CEO wants. This is flattery at its best, because you are now paying attention to some side conversation. Most of us don't listen at all. We're absorbed in our own worlds. When someone tells us something, we want to tell our own story. Or we just want to go ahead with our own agenda. But they will tell you what someone else in their world wants. And if you pay attention, you will find that suddenly you're able to negotiate with them without having to negotiate at all. And that's what Harvey Mackay found. He didn't get the results that he wanted right away. But somewhere down the line, the CEO called him and said, Hey, that envelope thing that you mentioned, we need some envelopes. 
And that's how he got an inroad. And you might think, well, I know this trick. But it's not a trick. It's just a human thing. The person wants to be acknowledged. They have something that they want. And finally, and finally, there is something that they want, but it takes a lot more effort for them to get it. And if you're paying attention, you're negotiating. That brings us to the end of this podcast. What is the one thing that you can do today? The one thing that you can do today is go up to your barista, ask their name, yes, even if they have a badge, then ask them a few details, and then do that for a second barista, and a third, and a fourth, until you know every single one in the cafe. And you will find that things have started to work for you. And you're not doing this because of some game that you're playing. You're just doing this because you're a human being. You and I, we're human beings. We need to be acknowledged. We need to acknowledge how tired somebody is, how difficult the day has been, things like that, not just have this small talk. And then you find that things just start to work for you in that small cafe environment, and then you can extrapolate that pretty much any way you want. That brings us to the end of this podcast. Let's find out what's happening in Psychotactics then. For the next month or so, we are headed away from the cafe in Auckland, and we're going off to a cafe in Portugal. Well, at least that's the way I describe it. We don't do much sightseeing or anything. We eat, we drink, we sleep. That's how we spend our month away. But we're also going to have a meetup in Singapore. And I don't know if you'll get to this before we have our meetup. But if you do, then meet us in Singapore or in Portugal, in Lisbon. There's also a photography workshop at the end of May, if you're keen. And that's also in Lisbon. Have a look at the Psychotactics website, and while you're there, also have a look at psychotactics.com slash you goodies. That's you for umbrella goodies. And that's because on March 24th, you have the uniqueness course that's being released. And the uniqueness course is, well, unique because unlike other courses which talk about a company uniqueness, you know, like... Apple has to have a uniqueness or Samsung has to have a uniqueness. No, we buy a specific iPhone. We buy a specific Galaxy. We buy products. And if you have one product, that has to have a uniqueness. If you have another course, that has to have a uniqueness. Everything that you do, all the products, all the services, all the workshops, they all have to have uniqueness. So you've got to create all of this consistently and It'll drive you completely bonkers if you don't know how to go about it. And this is the kind of thing that people struggle with because there are a thousand or ten thousand courses or products or workshops that are very similar to yours. Yours might be less expensive and you have to have a uniqueness so that people know why it's less expensive. It might be more expensive. Again, you have to have a uniqueness. But you don't have to buy anything right now. Go to psychotactics.com slash you goodies and just start there and you'll have enough to get going. And that's pretty much it from Psychotactics Land. I'll say bye for now. Bye bye. Still listening? We go to a Japanese restaurant and Unlike most people, we go to a restaurant and then we go every week. 
For instance, we went every Tuesday to an Indian restaurant for 18 years in a row, except when we were on holiday. And it's similar for the Japanese restaurant, except we've been going only three or four years, maybe. Anyway, when we went there, we'd do the transaction. We'd pay for the meal. They'd give us a good meal. End of story. But one day, I made some food, and I took it over and gave it to them, and nothing happened. But the next time, instead of giving us the usual eight pieces of sushi, which is part of the transaction, you know, I pay for eight, you give me eight, he gave us nine pieces. A few weeks later, I made some other food, I took it over, now the sushi has gone to 10 pieces. Last week, we're up to 12 pieces of sushi. Nobody has said a word. Nobody has said, hey, I'm bringing you food, or you bring me food, or I'll do this and you'll do that. And yet a negotiation is happening. Both parties are being acknowledged. Both parties are figuring out what the other one wants. And as a lot of negotiators say, it's win-win. So there you go. Try and figure out what the other person wants. And like sometimes have a chat at least. I'll say bye for now. Bye-bye and see you in 5000 BC. Mm-hmm.